So the current approach with cybersecurity is flawed because we're too focused on finding the problem and not on educating people how to write secure code in the first place. The entire industry is actually focused on coming from right to left where you really want to do penetration testing first, where you really want to find a problem and you want to find a problem as soon as possible. So people are still focused on, hey, what are they doing wrong after the code is written? Um, what we actually propose is that you start with training where you're going to tell people how to write secure code in the first place. Um, you give them the tools um, to make sure that they can write secure code when they're doing, when they're coding, they are guided in writing the code that is secure from the start. Um, and that's the only way you're going to fix application security problems. Um, you're going to write secure code from the start. Um, of course, you need to double check and verify that what people have written is correct, but you really need to start with educating people, making sure um, that they know these concepts of security, that they really understand what can go wrong if they do not do it right. Um, and you have to provide them with the tools to make sure that on a day-to-day -day basis, um, they can write secure code. First of all, they are not taught at university how to code securely. If you talk about security, um, they know about crypto, but not about writing secure applications. And even if they do so, they do it in one specific language, for example, Java. Um, when they come to an actual company, um, well, it's not going to be that particular Java framework that they have to code in, and it's not going to be exactly the security as what they have been taught at university, it's, it's going to be something very specific for that organization. So you really need a training course which is specific to um, the language and the framework of what they're using on a day-to-day -day basis. And you actually need to do that on a, on, on a continuous basis. Why? Because developers move around in organizations. Um, um, today, they're working on the back end and they need to know about problems like SQL injection. Um, tomorrow, they may do stuff on the front end and they may need to know stuff about um, process scripting, for example. So there are 700 different categories of problems that they can introduce into the code. Um, they need to learn what they need at a specific time in the organization where they, where they sit. So in today's world, it's very hard for managers to engage developers in, in writing secure code and thinking about security because it's not their main job for developers. Um, developers know that there's a security department. Um, their job is to write features and they think that they hand it off to security and they are going to sprinkle some magic on top of their code and everything is going to be secure. And, and that's not the case. The, the developer owns the software. He needs to embed security into the, into the software. So developers are really good at writing software and they consider that as their baby. Um, security is really good at finding problems, but not necessarily telling how to fix the problem. They're really good at poking at the, at the software and saying, hey, you know, there's, there's holes in here. We do not know how to fix it, but, but, it, but it's broken. Um, so there's definitely a disconnect between these two groups. There's definitely a disconnect between the developers that really want to write code and write awesome features and the security people that, first of all, poke flaws in, in, into, the, into the software, do not know how to fix it. Um, and, and at the same time, um, they're not able to communicate with each other. And also, de developers have to have everything right, where security people only have to find one problem and, and they're golden. They're like, well, it's, it's broken. So th there's, they, they speak different languages. They speak different languages and, and getting them together is really, really hard. So the shift left movement is all about finding problems earlier on in the in development life cycle bringing it closer and closer to the developer so instead of finding problems late in the development life cycle how can we um, provide solutions to the developer that he is notified earlier on that something is wrong with his code um, what, what, what why has shift left not not fixed um, the, the problem well first of all it, it's a it's a it's a new thing it's it's it's, it's fairly new but I would assume that they're a little bit focusing on the wrong things. They're trying to find a problem early on um, and not really trying to guide the developer in writing secure code. So what they're doing is instead of finding the problem very late in the development lifecycle, they want to find problems earlier on, closer when the, the, the developer is typing. Um, but it's still about finding the problem. It's not about telling people how to do it securely from the start. It's not about teaching people why they have to do it securely from the start.
I would think that they're spending a little bit too much on the reaction phase, on, on finding the problems late in the development life cycle, and, and not spending money on the prevention side where you say, hey, let's provide the developers with a good training. Let's provide developers with a good solution that guides them while they are writing code. Um, so I, I, would, I would say that have a look at where you're spending um, and have a look at the ROI. Um, how many problems do you actually fix? Not find. Finding is easy. You, you can find a million problems in code, but how, how many problems are you fixing on a day-to-day -day basis? And how many problems are developers not introducing because they are aware of certain security concepts? Um, so calculate what, what you're doing today. Calculate how much you're spending, what your return of investment is, return of investment is um, and see if you're optimizing in these buckets, in, in training, in coding, when you push stuff into the technology, into, into your repositories, in testing, in production. See where you're spending money, see what you're getting out of it, um, and see if your budget is really optimized along these um, SDLC buckets. So SQL injection is indeed a known problem for 20 years. Um, uh, it, it, is, it is known for 20 years. We know a fix for 19 years and a good 300 days. Um, however, it's still happening. Um, the, the reason why it's still happening is, is actually twofold. So first of all, um, we have a lot of legacy code in, in, our, in, our, um, in our organizations, um, and people did not know how to code. So there's, there's still um, legacy problems in our, in our code, SQL injection problems. Into our code. So somebody needs to fix that, but you need to provide them with the guidance on how to fix that. Um, moving forward, um, people are still introducing SQL injection. Why? Um, well, they still need to build on top of that legacy code and they are not educated on how to prevent that in the first place. So they keep on introducing the, 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 the same problem over and over and over again. Um, <clears throat> what, what's the solution to the problem here? Um, it's, it's again twofold. It, it is, first of all, making sure that developers understand what the problem is with SQL injection, that they have an understanding what the consequences are of introducing a SQL injection into the code, and also making sure um, that they will not introduce that problem into the code so that they know how to write secure code from the start. Not introducing the problem first and then fixing the problem, really writing secure code from the start. And, and I think we need to help them along the way with training, with guidance, and, and verifying that, that what they're doing is correct. So the difference between writing secure code from the start and finding and fixing vulnerabilities is that when you find a problem late in the development lifecycle, um, a lot of people are involved to get that back to the developer. Um, it, there's, there's definitely a time that goes by, so the developer has to get back into his zone when he was writing that piece of code. It may even be a piece of code that he has not written because that person that wrote the problem has already left. Um, so it, it takes a long time in days until it gets back to the developer, so you're essentially exposed. Um, and it takes a lot of resources to get it back to the developer, plus it, gets, it, it requires a lot of resources to get it fixed because your developer has to get back to that code, understand the code, oh, who has written that code, what is it doing, or what is essentially the problem over here, and figure out a solution. Um, writing secure code from the start, if, if you start with some coding principles, secure coding principles, and you always do the same things the same way so that you produce secure code, um, it's, it's a very different model. You're, you're not going to try to find the problem and have this, that very long cycle until, until it gets back to the developer. No, you're going to put your principles first, your coding principles first. You're going to code along these coding principles, and the end result will be a, a secure application. So um, it's a little bit more of an upfront work because you need to set these coding principles, but in the long run, it's, it's much more beneficial. It's much, much more efficient than trying to find and fix problems um, in the development life cycle, late in the development life cycle. Is, um, they will not get back the problems afterwards. Um, what they will do is they will generally improve the security posture of their, um, of their organization by writing secure code. They will push out um, applications that are not inherent vulnerable to, to, to problems. So what they're doing is they work more efficient. They work more efficient because they will 
produce secure code from the start and they do not have to spend days afterwards and other people in the organization do not have to spend days afterwards finding the problems, getting it back to the developer, figuring out how to fix it and getting back into, well, what was written over here? How does that work more specifically and how do I fix it? So in, in general, you, you're saving a lot of days um, from not only your developers, but also people in QA and in product management. So in your entire organization, if you start to code securely from the start, you're going to save a lot of man days and essentially money um, along the way. So the best way to roll out Secure Code Warrior um, Sensei's plugin is um, you really have to start with training. You have to start with training first. And, and the, the, the best analogy that I can come up with is assume that you want to fly a plane. If you want to fly a plane, um, they will not give you a plane from the start and say, fly off. No, if you want to fly a plane, normally you first go into a simulator. You learn about the instruments. Um, you learn about how you can virtually fly a plane, but that is not your end goal. Your end goal is you really, really want to fly a plane. And if you fly a plane, you really want to have an experienced co-pilot next to you that can guide you through some unforeseen circumstances, like, for example, a storm. And exactly the same analogy works for, for secure coding. If you come out of university, you start at a company, they give you a computer, and they will not give you a computer and say, write some code. Um, they should not do that because you do not know how to write secure code. What they should do is they should give you a very decent training in the language and the framework that you're using on a day-to-day -day basis. But that, that cannot be your end goal. Your end goal is not the training. Your end goal is to write secure features. And if you're writing secure features, you want to have an experienced IDE plugin that is guiding you through things that you've not seen during that training. Um, and um, making sure that you follow the coding policy guidelines within that organization. So when you're writing code, your end goal, you need an experienced co-pilot, the Sensei plugin, that is guiding you in writing secure code. But it all starts with training. You have to understand these security concepts first, but it cannot be your end goal. Your end goal is to write secure features. So today, the, the problem with false positives in our industry is um, we're frustrating developers with asking them to fix stuff which is not truly broken. Tools can only do a certain amount of, of, of analysis, and they come back with results. And somebody needs to look into these results and get them back to the developers. Um, quite often, these tools find more problems and, and more things, and they find issues that are not real problems. And that frustrates the developer because a developer in nature is going to challenge people and is going to say, well, but why is that exactly a problem? And if they ask that question, the security guys are going to be a little bit frustrated because they, they, they think like, well, just, just fix it and let's move on. While a developer really wants to know, but, but I don't think this is a problem. I really want to see why this is a problem, why I need to fix that, because you're essentially distracting me from my job. Um, and again, you, you, you feel that natural um, um, tendency between your developers and your security people where the the developers really want to focus on writing secure features and the security people really want to make sure that they fix a couple of things. And, and false positives is, is definitely an annoyance for developers. And, and it's something that security people, you know, they just want to get stuff fixed. And if there's a couple of things that shouldn't really be fixed, you know, just move on, just fix it and move on. And a better strategy is to set some coding guidelines from the start and say, hey, you know what, we're going to code according to a, a rule book where we say we're going to code according to certain security standards, and the end result is going to be a secure application. So we're no longer talking about false positives. That, that kind of notion is, is not really known over here. We're talking about, do you follow the policy or do you not follow the policy? And if you follow the policy, you're going to produce secure code. If you do not follow the policy, I don't know. You, you may produce secure code. You, you may not produce secure code. But for sure, I know if you follow the policy, you're going to produce secure code. So it's, it's, it's a better strategy and, and you kind of avoid that whole um, struggle between developers and security because of that annoyance, which is called false positives. The difference between a regular static analysis solution and the Sensei solution is that static analysis solutions are, tend to happen offline on the entire code base with a specific code focus on finding vulnerabilities in code. They really want to find the SQL injections, the cross-site scriptings in code. Um, that is not the approach that we're taking with Sensei. Um, we're, we're not offline, we are in real time, and we're not focusing 
on finding the problem. And, and this may be very counterintuitive. We're not focusing on, on finding the problem. No, we're really focusing on building secure applications from the start. We're really focusing on putting coding guidelines in place where you're going to produce, where the end result, if you follow them, is going to be a secure application. So we are not focused on finding the problem. We are focused on guiding a developer in writing secure codes.